Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Richard Orm from the DAISY Consortium and I'm your host for today's webinar. Metadata is an important ingredient in all digital publications. Metadata about accessibility can play an essential role to help identify whether a publication has features that are important to consumers with accessibility related requirements or indeed if there are accessibility hazards or barriers. So metadata is important, but it can be a difficult subject to get to grips with. In this webinar, we've brought together three wonderful individuals with deep knowledge across different domains. I'll be back after the presentations to moderate the questions, but at this point, I'll hand over to our panelists who will introduce themselves and tell us about metadata in publishing the hidden information essential for accessibility. Hello, this is Madeline Rothberg from the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH. WGBH has over 45 years of history in making it media accessible to people with disabilities. And most recently, I've spent about 15 years now working on accessibility metadata. So I'm happy to share that with you today. Hello, my name is Chris Sainer. I'm from Editor. Editor is a standards organization based in London. Uh, we create, um, maintain and build resources for the use of these standards and for use in the global book supply chain. Hello everybody. Uh, this is Luc Momet. I'm working for the Accessible Books Consortium at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. I'm a librarian and I've been specialized in access to reading for print impaired persons for nearly 20 years now. And I will be uh, presenting specifically on about metadata in the library world. So as an overview, I'll begin by speaking about accessibility metadata in EPUB. And then Chris will speak about accessibility metadata in Onyx and Luke about library metadata and specialist formats. And then we'll all be available during the Q&A. So put your questions in the Q&A module. Accessibility metadata in EPUB can be used in a number of ways. So if you're providing books, but you haven't reached all of your accessibility goals yet, you can use the metadata to tell us what you do know about your publication. If you've made a publication that's fully accessible, then you can shout about it with your metadata. And if you've made a publication that's highly accessible for some readers, but inaccessible for other readers, the metadata is really important there too. So it will help readers find books that suit them and avoid books that they can't use. EPUB metadata in particular is carried inside the publication. It's sometimes called package metadata. And it's a little bit trickier to arrange, so you'll want to look at the documentation. You can also uh, provide metadata about your EPUB with linked metadata, a record outside the publication. But the way that precedence is handled between if there's metadata inside and outside is different in different versions of the EPUB standard. So do look carefully at the, at the documentation when you make those decisions. Also, um, it's important to know that using accessibility metadata is required if you're aiming to meet the EPUB accessibility 1.0 conformance requirements. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the different ways to do that. The EPUB accessibility documents lay out three kinds of EPUBs. A document might be discoverable, meaning it has metadata to help users find it, even if it doesn't meet all accessibility requirements. It might be what's termed accessible, which means it, meets the, it provides the discovery metadata, but also meets the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 at any level and additional EPUB accessibility requirements. Or it might be an optimized document. And these are the ones that are for a certain audience and specialized, but might not serve all audiences. And they have their own uh, requirements in the EPUB accessibility document for metadata. So discovery metadata describes the publication's content. And this is the one that's useful no matter what kind of publications you're sharing. This metadata is written up at the schema.org uh, standard website. And there's uh, required elements, recommended and optional. So required is that you describe the types of media that are included in your publication. And that uses a term called access mode. 
visual, textual, auditory, what kinds of things are in there. Secondly, you're required to name any accessibility features you have and also any accessibility hazards. The most common hazard obviously is flashing, uh, which can cause seizures in light sensitive people with epilepsy. Um, those are not common in most booky books, but as we move into integrated multimedia kinds of books, they're a hazard. And the accessibility features describes things you might be doing to make your book or publication more accessible, like image descriptions, uh, captions on any embedded audio or video, and so on. And finally, you're required to provide a human readable summary in the accessibility summary field. And this might summarize all of the other features or it might describe some nuances that are, are tricky but that a user needs to know when they decide if they want your book. It's recommended that you use a term called access mode sufficient, which is a way to describe all the different ways a publication can be used. For example, read with the eyes, read with the ears, read with eyes and ears together, and so on. It's a little bit uh, more complicated and that's why it's recommended but not required. And optionally, if you do have any interactive features in the publication, there are fields for describing any accessibility work that's been done on those interactive features. For conformance reporting, if you've created a fully accessible publication, you'll want to state the web content accessibility guidelines conformance level you'll met, you've met and you'll use the Dublin core metadata term conforms to, to do that. So conforms to WCAG level A, AA, AAA. And there's a specific syntax for writing up those conformance statements that's available in the guidance documents. Additionally, um, for EPUB conformance reporting, there are some metadata terms to report about your conformance claim. And the required one is certified by. And this is where you name the organization that has certified that you meet the WCAG level you are claiming to meet. And it might be the publisher, it might be a third party testing service, whoever is providing that testing and certification. Optionally, you can give a little more information about the certifier and the report by saying who, who has credentialed this certifier if you've passed a particular training or used a particular certification credentialing service and a link to the report if you can make the full conformance report available to the readers. Finally, those optimized publications. Optimized publications are really important to certain groups. For example, if you're producing DAISY audio or if you're sharing braille ready files, um, those files are not accessible to people who can't use them, i.e. the audio file is not accessible to someone who can't hear and braille ready files are only useful for those who read braille. These are still important pieces of the accessibility infrastructure. We just want to report them accurately. And so we use the conforms to field to report what optimization standard have you followed. We also strongly recommend that you use a human readable description with an optimized publication. And this uses the schema.org metadata for accessibility summary. It allows you to say, this is an audiobook. It offers text for navigation only or whatever the specifics of the circumstances. Some tools that will help you create accessible EPUB. First of all, the schema.org website, which has the full list of accessibility terms. And these slides and resources will all be available, as Richard mentioned, after the webinar. The W3C website is where the schema.org terms have their full vocabulary defined. So I've got a link straight to the W3C uh, vocabulary page where all of the terms you can use are well defined. And in addition, you might be interested in the ACE by DAISY EPUB accessibility checker. It checks the accessibility of your uh, publication, but it also has a module that will show you what metadata is already in your package and give you an editor to edit or insert metadata into the EPUB if you haven't done it yet, but you know what you need to say about your publication. So that's a terrific tool. This is a brief snippet of uh, JSON LD metadata, and I don't expect everyone to learn how to create metadata looking at this slide, but I want to make sure that you know that when you visit the schema.org website, we have six fully written examples of accessibility metadata in schema, but you have to click on the JSON LD part of the page to get to them because the other options aren't written out. So uh, you can go to the schema.org website, pick any of our accessibility terms such as access mode and go to the JSON LD examples to see fully written text examples. You can also read this in the slide once you get the slides. 
Finally, some resources for EPUB. Uh, I've got links to the EPUB Accessibility 1.0 document itself, which is currently a submission to the W3C to become part of the W3C's publications uh, publication group. In addition, there's an accessibility techniques document, which still lives at the IDPF website. So I've got a link for that. And that will give you really specific examples and techniques about how to use metadata in EPUB. And finally, there's a crosswalk between EPUB metadata and Onyx metadata. And Chris is gonna speak next about Onyx metadata. And I, so I wanted to let you know that we've uh, collaboratively compiled a crosswalk that explains some of the commonalities and differences between the EPUB metadata and the Onyx metadata. So now I will hand it over to Chris to tell you more. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madeline. Um, so Madeline's been showing you and talking to you about the kind of metadata that should be included in the EPUB. And I'm going to be looking at the kind of metadata that should be um, accompanying that EPUB file, um, either sent with the file or sent separately in a separate metadata supply chain to the book trade. The most common um, <clears throat> method of supplying accessibility metadata in the book trade um, is via Onyx for Books. And for those of you who are not familiar with Onyx for Books, it's a standard uh, message that's widely used around the globe and is used for the communication of metadata about physical books, digital books, audio books, and related products in the global book supply chain. It's managed by editor. Um, it's been around for over 20 years. There are two versions that you may be familiar with. The version 2.1, which was published originally in June 2003 and was then sunsetted in 2014, but is still used by <clears throat> some actors in the supply chain in the US, Canada, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Then the current version of Onyx is Onyx 3. Um, this was published in April 2009 and is still the current version. The current iteration of Onyx 3 is 3.0.7, but when we talk about iterations, and that is because new elements have been added, but they're fully backward compatible. So basically Onyx 3 has been stable and usable for over 10 years. So Onyx is made up of um, simple XML syntax and code lists, controlled vocabularies. Now, those code lists are things that may be revised. By revision, we may be requested to update um, the words or the meanings um, to make sure that they make sense to everybody, or we may be asked to add new additions. So for example, if there's a new requirement in accessibility, um, <clears throat> we may get a request from um, maybe from Daisy to add a new um, value. What we would do is we would then consult with other people who are experts in accessibility, make a proposal, and then those proposals go out to national user groups. Um, these groups are made up of different representatives um, from the book trade in their particular countries. They discuss these proposals and then we meet. Um, <clears throat> we have an international steering committee that will meet, discuss, and validate or reject any proposed new codes. So nothing is added to the Onyx um, controlled vocabularies without full compliance. Now Onyx 3 <clears throat> is the one that's mostly, is best suited for digital books. That is why Onyx 3 was originally created, is to meet the needs of digital publications. Um, Onyx 3 has really good uh, quality control material. We publish an XSD and a strict um, version of that XSD that checks the quality of the metadata. So <clears throat> Onyx has always been able to describe things like Braille, editions, large print, the DAISY products, different formats of books, audio, digital. And Onyx is used to describe the, the features of a book when it comes to accessibility. You can give really granular descriptions, or you can also specify the book's conformance to particular standards. 
What Onyx doesn't do is describe the system functionality of reading systems, reading platforms. So Onyx is there to describe the books. There was a working group um, met in 2010, 2011 that made suggestions for the metadata that we needed to add to Onyx to convey information about digital publication accessibility. And that resulted in list 196. Um, it was done in such a way that it could be used in either format, both Onyx 2.1 and Onyx 3. And it was also designed and added so it could be used in a very simple composite that existed already in Onyx 2 and in Onyx 3 called product form feature. Onyx 3 can also convey other information that may be of use to describe accessibility. It can describe, for example, if there are limitations set on things like text to speech. There's, um, there's a list to describe the type of media it is. So you can say if it's primarily text, primarily audio, if there's text plus audio, that kind of thing. You can even include the snippet, the JSON LD snippet um, with schema.org um, data in your Onyx file. So that can be then embedded into an HTML page. So the Onyx code list 196, this is the important list. Um, so this came out of that working group um, and it's made up of different kinds of codes. So there are codes that are granular that describe the features of the, the accessible accessibility features of the book. So things like um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it has a navigable table of contents, um, it uses a logical reading order, that kind of things. You can also specify using this um, whether it's compliant, whether it complies to um, WCAG A, WCAG AA. You can also send information about conformance reporting. So everything that Madeleine covered in the EPUB section, you can also convey that information in an Onyx file. You can also convey things like you can put in a contact name for accessibility information. There's a, there's a value to say nothing has been disabled. So no reading system accessibility option has been disabled. And an important code, which is this title is inaccessible because we have relic um, digital books that were made a long time ago that publishers know do not meet accessibility requirements. And they want to say, we know this is inaccessible. So the granularity of those code values allow a reader to pick out their requirements for a, a book. They allow the publishers and retailers to characterize the features of that product. And hopefully we can match those two pro profiles together before the person buys the book. So I wanted to show you what a bit of Onyx looks like. This particular um, composite is called the product form feature. And this is how accessibility uh, metadata is sent in the Onyx. It's a very simple um, composite that is repeated and is repeated as many times as is necessary to use all the codes. If you look as a product form feature type 09, this just indicates to the people who receive the data, I'm giving you some information about accessibility and then the feature value will give you the particular feature. And that just repeats with all the information. It's really important this was used in Onyx 2, 2.1 and Onyx 3. Same simple structure. Anybody who's producing Onyx or anybody who's receiving Onyx should have no issues with dealing with this. It was done in the, in the most straightforward and simplest um, uh, format possible. So why add accessibility metadata to an Onyx when it's also just putting similar information into the EPUB itself. Well, as with the choice of any book, you do need to know things in advance. So a print impaired purchaser needs to know information about the title prior to purchase and maybe even prior to publication. They need to know if that book meets their needs. If the data is distributed in the Onyx standard, then data aggregators, libraries, retailers, can be made aware of the level of accessibility of a title before the, the title itself is available and can present 
this information to potential purchasers and readers within their catalog and allows them to build up search criteria. It's really important that we let prospective readers know how accessible a publication is via the metadata inside the EPUB and outside the EPUB. And not only should publishers make their products as accessible as reasonably possible, and as Madeline said, they should shout about that by making that information available in their metadata, but data aggregators and retailers should make use of that metadata, presenting the accessibility information to potential buyers and readers, as well as ensuring their online presence or storefronts are accessible as well. And just some basic uh, resources that are available. So these will be made available, as Richard said, after the presentation. There's a link directly to the famous code list 196. We've done a short paper on giving advice on using accessibility metadata in Onyx. And the link to that paper is there. And then there's the general link to more information about Onyx 3. And now I'm going to pass it on to Luke who will be talking about library metadata. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, share with you the experience of the Accessible, Accessible Books Consortium when it comes to library metadata and specialist formats. So first of all, the, the Accessible Books Consortium is a public-private partnership, partnership led by the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. And among other services, we have set up an online platform, which name is the ABC Global Book Service. This platform's platform allows participating libraries for the blind or libraries specialized in services to other categories of print input persons to easily exchange the accessible content they need. Those li libraries, uh, uh, 71 of those libraries, Libraries are participating in the ABC Global Book Service today. Uh, they are known as authorized entities or AEs. And those institutions are distributing accessible documents to print import persons, but also they are the main producers of the documents they are distributing. The exchanging, uh, the exchanges of accessible titles via the ABC Global Book Service are done within the framework of the Marrakesh Treaty, so we rely on exceptions to copyright. Today, the uh, ABC Global Book Service catalog uh, comprises more than 644,000 accessible titles. And uh, we have uh, documents in several accessible formats. The main one are DAISY, BRF, uh, Chris already uh, talked about this format, very ready format, MP3, EPUB, of course, and uh, many others. We have 17 different formats in the ABC Global Book Service today. The metadata used to build this centralized catalog is provided by the participating AEs, the participating uh, authorized entities. We are working with uh, a metadata format very well known uh, in the uh, library world, Mark 21. It's uh, metadata, metadata standard widely used, and Mark 21 has the ability to describe accessibility features. In Mark 21, uh, two fields are used for uh, to describe uh, accessibility feature, features: field 341, uh, named accessibility contents, and field. 532 accessibility notes. It should be noted that the, the introduction of these fields in the standard uh, is pretty recent. It dates back 2018. So we rely on the metadata shared with us by participating libraries to build a centralized catalog. And we have to face uh, some important limitations. Uh, first of all, uh, the accessibility metadata is applied differently from AE to AE. And uh, we see that Mark 21 is not used by the participating AEs, the libraries, in a standardized way to describe accessibility features. So uh, we see differences from metadata feed for, to metadata feed. And we also, uh, it's also very common that accessibility information is implicit. 
uh, I'll take an example to explain why, what I, I'm, I want to say here. Uh, for many li libraries, uh, they have been distributing accessible documents to uh, the, uh, a, clo a limited audience, their end users. And for many years, there was no need to uh, include any their metadata feed information, which were obvious for the end users, such as, for instance, for a library producing only audiobooks in DAISY 202 format with human narration. It was a well-known information for the end users uh, uh, accessing to the documents of this library that the format was uh, the format I just described. Now, of course, in the context of global cooperation, the fact that the information is not expressed specifically, it's a limitation. Um, at ABC, uh, we are using a solution we call mapping in order to go from uh, the wide range of uh, metadata feed we get from the AEs, uh, the participating libraries, and build from that a centralized catalog. So AEs uh, share with us metadata in the format they are able to export. It goes from Mark XML to Excel Sheets. Of course, we are very happy when we are able to get Mark XML, but we are able to handle a very, a very large range of uh, different formats in which they are able to share their metadata with us. Then at ABC maps the different fields in each catalog to its centralized catalog. It's a manual process. This mapping is a manual process. And uh, through exchanges with uh, the libraries, we uh, create a mapping. Then, of course, uh, this mapping is applied in an automated way to the metadata feed and to the updates, for instance. But at first, we have to describe manually uh, how we are going to map from the AE's library, participating library catalog to the centralized catalog field after field. So what have we, have we already achieved? Uh, again, we have a centralized catalog of uh, 634,000 titles, and that's very significant in this field. This catalog includes metadata describing the different formats, and uh, in, this is very important information, of course. And we also have metadata describing the main accessibility features. The next steps, uh, considering the knowledge we have now, we, we now have both knowledge and a need for uh, a more strong collaboration when it comes from metadata about uh, accessibility features in the library world. So next step for us will be active collaboration with the Libraries for Print Disabled Persons section of the International Federation of Library Associations working on a project on metadata on accessibility for library catalogs and uh, the main input from uh, ABC is this experience we now have on what is really available on the ground when it comes to metadata feeds in libraries producing accessible documents for print uh, in third persons and also uh, the need we uh, now have to uh, move forward and uh, agree on standards in order to be able to uh, automate uh, the exchanges of metadata in this field. As uh, said by the two previous presenters, the resources will be made available. On these slides, you have uh, three links, two links linking to the fields in uh, Mark 21, about uh, field 341 accessibility contents and 532 accessibility notes and also a link to the ABC Global Book Service which uh, presents more how, how we work, what we have achieved and where uh, we are heading to. Thank you so much, Madeline, Chris, and Luke, for those wonderful presentations. We've got a bunch of questions lined up for you, but let me first of all share the contact information for each of them because they've all kindly said that if we don't get uh, to a question that you have or you think of a question afterwards, you can reach out to each of these speakers. So it's possible to reach Madeline Rothberg from the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH at Madeline, M A D E L. E I N E underscore Rothberg, R O T H B R G at W G B H 
www.edinburghpodcast.org. And to reach Chris from Editeur, he's at chris at editeur.org. That's E-D-I-T-E-U-R dot org. And Luke Momet from the Accessible Book Consortium can be reached at luke, L-U-C dot Momet, M-A-U-M-E-T at wipo.int. And WIPO is W-I-P-O. So those are the contact uh, details for our presenters. And thank you for making that offer um, for follow-up questions. If we can now move, uh, Luke, to the next slide, we're in the discussion and Q&A. And our usual approach to this is to deal with the kind of general questions first before we move into the specific side of things. Um, so uh, I think there were great uh, descriptions of the um, specifics within each of those different metadata domains. What wasn't entirely clear to me, it didn't come out, was what the experience was of an end user, of a librarian, of someone who's looking to buy. How do they get access to this metadata? In what way does it become uh, surfaced for them? Uh, so maybe Madeline, you could handle that first in terms of the EPUB metadata. Sure. So the metadata that surfaced has to be surfaced by whatever organization is providing the books. And that's why it's so important to have all of these pieces together today on this webinar. Um, for many print impaired readers, it's their, it's, their, it's their local print impaired library that's providing them. And so that's why it's so important that the library groups are working on um, standardizing and sharing that metadata out. Um, if you're getting your books through a reseller, then there's a decent chance that you're getting it from the Onyx metadata because that's the what most retailers are using. And then there's some places kind of in between. There are um, there are um, academic publishers that provide their own accessible files through their own sites or through collaborations. And so those sites um, might be publishing the, mes the metadata out of the uh, EPUB files or from the Onyx feeds. Um, and so it's really up to the whoever is uh, um, creating the websites that are presenting the catalogs of books, whoever's the aggregator, um, needs to be the place that the accessibility metadata gets exposed. Madeline, thank you. And turning to Chris, Chris, you talked about the opportunity for someone maybe to check out the accessibility features and hazards of a title before they buy it, before they download it, before they borrow it, maybe even before the book is published. Could you expand on that a little? Well, <clears throat> Onyx, an Onyx message, they're designed for the book trade and with, as with all metadata about books, it's, it's best practice to send that metadata out in advance. That varies from country to country. In the US, a publisher may send out information six months in advance. In the UK, three months. In France, one month. But that metadata is made available to the book trade in advance. And so if that accessibility information is included in the Onyx file, then it allows uh, data aggregators, resellers, or people who receive the Onyx data to make that visible and allow people to see that in advance, make, let people make in advance decisions about purchases of accessible titles. Uh, and now turning to you, Luke, you mentioned Mark 21. Now, my limited understanding of this is that's a metadata standard that's used extensively, at least within many public library um, sectors. So this is maybe is where uh, a librarian in a public library who's looking at a mainstream digital publication could hope to see accessibility information about digital publications there. So did I get that right? Mark 21 is the public library uh, metadata that, um, standard that's important. And where are we at with the uh, possibility for librarians in my public library to tell me about the accessibility features of eBooks that they have in their catalogs? Well, Mark. 21 is a very important uh, metadata standard and the, the mark family of uh, for, uh, metadata standard is uh, today uh, widely used among among public libraries yes uh, relying on such such a standard is a nice uh, way to also uh, 
gets to uh, the day where public libraries will be able to more easily expose information uh, about uh, feature meta metadata about accessibility features in their catalog. But when it comes to the specialized li libraries I described, we, we have to, to keep in mind that we, we see two, two, two things evolving at the same time. Uh, on one hand, uh, we need more standardization about uh, metadata, uh, metadata sharing and metadata production. And also on the other end, these institutions, many of them are very specialized institutions. And at the same time, they have started to collaborate with public libraries. So we, we are pretty optimistic, optimistic when it comes to sharing this kind of information coming from the very uh, specialized uh, sector of libraries producing accessible documents with the public libraries. And so you see Mark 21 evolving in the way that we heard uh, the schema.org based uh, EPUB uh, in package metadata and the Onyx has evolved. You see Mark 21 evolving in the same way to take account of new um, accessibility properties and maybe crosswalks between these different standards. I that, see. Is that right? I see libraries metadata standard evolving uh, in a way that uh, will allow them to express all the accessibility features and I, at the same time I uh, see uh, the very specialized libraries working in this field embracing these standards. We need, we need the two things um, but I guess we are at this moment where the, for the first time we have a knowledge of what is going on in many many institutions now because they have started cooperating under the provisions of the Marrakesh Treaty. And at the same time, we see the, the we know what they do. And on the other end, uh, we see the need and they see the need for more, more collaboration and more standardization of uh, accessible documents production. It has been done for many years, but now also for metadata production. Thank you. And I see one question here from Amy, which I think Luke is uh, more for you and then I'll turn to some other questions for other panelists. This question I think is for you. Are you aware of any work to get accessibility uh, statements it says here in US Mark as well? So I'm guessing that US Mark is part of the Mark family. Yes you are very right and uh, no I'm not aware of such an effort but maybe I'm not technical enough to answer to this question. Okay. All right. So let's move also then to a question that came up early in the session, which was, Madeline, you talked about the accessibility hazard property. And I guess there's a, um, uh, a link to a related uh, uh, field for uh, Onyx. Um, you gave the example of flashing. Are there other examples of hazards that publishers uh, should be aware of uh, in order to make sure that they're representing that in their titles? Or is flashing really the one that people are coming across right now? The, um, the other most common hazard is one that may not apply as, as much to books that are mostly words, but um, many people are sensitive to motion on a screen. And so we have a motion hazard. If you've got a simulation of a roller coaster, for example, embedded in a physics textbook, there are users for whom watching that roller coaster simulation might uh, cause physical harm or illness. Um, so that's, I think, probably the second most common one. Um, there's some research on hazards from certain kinds of audio that certain kinds of auditory signals can uh, trigger seizures in some. Um, people, but it's not as well defined, so we don't see a lot of uptake on that yet. Thank you. And another one for you, Madeline, I think, uh, and this is, I think, a chance to explain something again because I'm not well. The question for, is from Juliet it's for EPUB, is it preferable to use JSON or Onyx? And if both are used, does one override the other? So, I guess I'll give a little bit of a combo answer here, and Chris may jump in. Um, Currently, you, for, for an EPUB itself, if you want to put the metadata inside the EPUB package, then you'll need to do that using the EPUB package metadata. Um, and that may be JSON or it may be something else. Um, whereas if you want to distribute the metadata outside of it, then you're going to use a link record like an Onyx. Um, 
whether one overrides the other depends on which version of EPUB you're using. So that's why I cautioned you to check the documentation because the rules for whether the linked record would um, override or be uh, discarded were changed between versions. And the reason that this is tricky is you have to think hard about which one is more likely to be accurate. So when the book was made, was all the right metadata put in it? Or later were new accessibility features somehow added, but the metadata inside the document wasn't updated? Those are the, those are the tricky questions. And so I think the most important thing there is to speak to the people in your, uh, in your supply chain, whether that's retail or through the libraries, and to figure out which records they'll be using and how often those get updated so that you know that people are always going to use the most up-to-date version of your metadata so that you can correct any errors and know that the corrections will be propagated. So I don't um, think that's something that we can kind of answer as a one-size-fits-all, one is better than the other. But Chris, please give me your perspective. I, I agree with what you've just said. Um, and it's one of the, it's, it's why we have the three of us talking today. It's really important that the different um, actors in the the workflow when you're producing accessible books and when you're producing the metadata talk to each other because as with other aspects of metadata it's important that the information that's in the inside the EPUB pack and the information that's in the Onyx are kept up to date um, and for example you don't assume that once the Onyx has been done you can just leave it so it's important that systems update each other because as soon as there's a clash in different information. So if the information in JSON, the information in Onyx and the information in Mark are different, that causes if issues in the supply chain and gives out misleading information to the end user. And Chris, I think we have another question for you from Robbie. And this question is, where would one put the JSON LD out of the EPUB in Onyx 3? Which block? It goes in block two, collateral detail. Um, text content and it's a text type 24 and Madeline to you I think so you talked about the certified by um, uh, field and this was in your required list if I remember that correctly no certified yes certified by is who is certifying that this document is accessible um, so that's required because if you're going to claim that something is meeting the web content accessibility guidelines, you, you need to stand behind that. So in some cases, that might be the publisher themselves if they're doing internal testing or the library themselves that's producing sure. the book. Um, yep. They can go ahead and put their own name in certified by, and that just informs the reader that this library has done that testing themselves or this retailer. Sure. So if a publisher. a publisher has done their own internal testing or maybe they've... Uh, they have some mechanism set up for that. They're confident that their meets, uh, um, say, WCAG AA, they then need to put their own publisher details in the certified by um, field. That would be the correct way to handle that. That's right. And if they have, um, if they're following a specific guidance on how to do certification or if they've been trained or, or credentialed, then they might want to wish that use the certifier credential field to say, no, really, just because I'm the publisher, you, you can trust me. I, you know, I'm following this outside group's certification standard or I've been trained by this group and so on. For an EPUB, do we have to put the accessibility metadata in the file or is it sufficient to put it in, say, just the Onyx feed? Well, the accessibility metadata in the Onyx feed is really useful in some circumstances, as we've been talking about. But if your goal is to meet the EPUB Accessibility 1.0 conformance requirements, you will need to put the accessibility metadata inside the EPUB using the schema.org and other accessibility metadata specifications I described, because that is a requirement of the EPUB conformance statement. Now we have a question here from Kirsten, uh, who is saying, do you know if mainstream retailers like Amazon or Google are using the accessibility metadata and accepting accessible EPUB files? I do know that, for example, Rakuten Kobo are very interested in accessibility metadata in an Onyx file. Um, their biggest issue is persuading publishers to put it in the Onyx file. Um, Amazon, as some of you may know, is having a major push to get 
people who send them Onyx to stop using 2.1, start using Onyx 3. They've done the physical books. They're moving to the digital um, next year. What they, companies like them are doing are trying to um, impose best practices on good quality metadata, and then they can start asking for metadata um, about accessibility. Um, Google, I do not know about. There is, there is a desire to see accessibility metadata in the trade, um, but this is the vicious catch-22. I'm not adding it because nobody wants it. We're not using it because nobody is sending it. Um, so even to from going to Luke's point about Mark 21, Mark um, metadata is incredibly important and there are specialists who will take Onyx feeds from publishers and convert those to Mark records. So of course they can also add in the accessibility information if that's available in the Onyx feeds. So I'd say to any publisher, it's important to start adding that metadata to your Onyx feeds. So then um, big uh, retailers will see that that data is there. Thank you. And part of that question was whether Amazon or Google are accepting accessible EPUB files. Well, thank you for addressing the question about accessibility metadata. I always hesitate to kind of half answer a question as the host, but absolutely they're accepting accessible EPUB files. They love those. Uh, um, this this um, answer was kind of framed around, what are they doing with the accessibility metadata when it comes um, to them? And it seems to me that the accessibility summary would be particularly helpful for many people, uh, particularly to end users and the um, uh, and the librarians and folks supporting them. Um, what kind of guidance is there for people to complete the accessibility metadata uh, in terms of the summary so folk don't have to get into the details of all these fields and they get a sense of what uh, is available to them in a publication through the summary? Um, this is Madeline and I would say the accessibility summary is a very important piece because um, we are we are working um, on a document to help explain accessibility metadata for aggregators and how they can present it on their websites to be as user friendly for users as possible. But certainly the intricacies of the metadata can be a little complicated and some cases are more complicated than others. For example, we've tried to work through writing the right metadata for a use case like a dictionary that has audio to pronounce each word, but it's not an audio book most of what you need from that book you have to be able to use the textual content for and the audio only provides a supplement in the pronunciations. So that's the kind of thing where um, while we can make the metadata as precise as we like, a human readable summary that just explains that this is a dictionary, it's mostly text and has uh, pronunciations would be the best way to make sure that everyone understands the, the human implications of the metadata. Um, so now we have a question from Teresa, and Teresa, it seems to me, is working in a library, supporting uh, readers, including those with print disabilities. Teresa says, we've been adding accessibility metadata to our library's mark records for their physical collections. It's all done manually. And their ebooks and um, uh, other records are all created by the vendors who sell the books. So they can do it for the physical um, assets, but for the digital uh, ebooks, they're using what comes from the vendors. Uh, and what they're seeing is these records don't include accessibility features so, and accessibility metadata. Any suggestions for how they can get this accessibility metadata added by the vendors? The, uh, <clears throat> um, if they are, if the vendors are supplying data in Onyx. It's very simple. To, I would just go back to them and ask them, can you add this to your Onyx? And if not, why not? Because as I pointed out in the slides, it's done in such a simple way to be added to the Onyx thing. I think that's part of the things is to start feeding back down the supply chain. We do want this information. Are you using it? How are you using it? You can point them to our documentation on how to add accessibility metadata. Um, it's important that people in the supply chain know that people want that information because a lot of people who work in publishing very busy. Um, they don't actually don't always understand that maybe somebody would want that information further down the supply chain. So I think that's one of the things you can do is communicate that back to your vendors. 
And Teresa adds that we just don't have the staff available to manually look at an ebook and figure out if it's accessible or not, and then somehow, you know, add that data uh, somehow. So there is a plea there that that can be done once through the distribution chain. So that actually also describes a really good value out of doing this. Um, a linked question from uh, Sabrina is if that metadata doesn't exist for a title, uh, how about being able to go to the publisher directly and asking for the appropriate metadata? So um, is that what you were suggesting, Chris, uh, going back to the supplier or what about going back to the publisher themselves? Is yes. that an option for Sabrina? It is an option because publishers uh, are the source of the Onyx data. Um, they're the um, original um, source of truth about that. And they're the ones that are going to make the decision. So yes, go back to the publisher themselves. Um, find out who the accessibility contact is at that publisher, if they have one, and say that, or their Onyx or metadata person, and say, we need this information in your Onyx file. Super. So um, you've described, um, all three of you, some great information about what's available now. I'd like to hear now, if you could just describe how you see accessibility metadata in the domains in which you particularly have expertise changing over the next uh, two years and what difference that would make for readers with print disabilities and the people that are working to support them. So maybe we can handle this in the same order in which we did the panel. So Madeline, what are your thoughts on what comes next and how things are going to improve? Um, I would say I think we see some some really good things on the horizon. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on a metadata user in, user interface guide for aggregators. And these aggregators include um, people who serve higher education, where there's a huge amount of need. As was just discussed, really the need for better metadata has to come up from the end customers, which in this case is the library or the university or the bookseller who needs to communicate to the publisher or provider that this is required for what they want to give to their readers. So without that pressure up from the bottom, we'll probably just hear publishers saying, well, nobody asked for it, so why should I put some effort in? Because obviously it does take some effort to create and spin up a, a system for putting accessibility metadata in all of your records. So we need to hear those end users asking for it, and I think we have been. Um, we've been getting some commentary on our user interface guide from some large aggregators who are eager to start exposing that metadata. And so I hope that we'll see as uh, we complete our transition to online everything uh, that the metadata is available for more and more users. And Chris? I hope to see uh, that it becomes standard practice for publishers who produce accessible digital publications to add that metadata automatically to their Onyx feed. Um, I also hope to see as soon as one retail platform starts exposing that metadata, I think that will knock publishers. Um, they will all start thinking about adding that metadata to their to their Onyx feeds. Um, I think as 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 Amazon moves to only accepting one form of Onyx, we will get much tidier and better metadata because Onyx three is actually much better than Onyx two point one, which was good. Um, and part of that process can be to start requiring um, accessible accessibility metadata. And I think others will start doing that as well. I hope. <laughs> and Luke, your thoughts in terms of the public library uh, world and I suppose special libraries. In the special libraries field, um, I'm convinced we are going to see in the near future uh, more and more standardization uh, regarding the way metadata uh, is produced regarding accessibility. Uh, it would, of course, help uh, public libraries to uh, become the front office they need to be. They are providing services to the general population and we need public libraries to uh, be able to make loans with documents produced by the specialized sector more and more. And in the same, same movement, uh, it will allow also uh, print impaired users who are relying today on very uh, specialist uh, format and uh, the production within the specialized field of, of libraries for print impaired persons also to start using more and more documents uh, coming uh, 
um, being uh, produced as uh, born accessible coming from the uh, commercial uh, publishing fields uh, as uh, the rest of the population. And uh, I hope that the standardization on the specialized uh, world will help both, both uh, sectors to, to, to communicate and work more together for pretty important persons to gain access to all the documents they need. Thank you so much for those three reflections and bringing them all together, of course, we'll know this is working when users are able to see this accessibility uh, information uh, about the titles that they're choosing to borrow or buy. And uh, you mentioned the user experience guide for accessibility metadata will include Madeline, you mentioned that. We'll include a link to that in the resources. This helps those that are building the distribution systems, the library systems, the retail systems, how they can expose this in the way that's most useful for end users. Um, and there's a guide uh, to that that's been uh, produced. So we'll include a link to that in our resources. We'll also include a link to the DAISY knowledge base, uh, which includes information on Onyx and on uh, schema.org metadata and has some great examples in there. Okay, we're coming to the end of the session. Madeline, Chris and Luke, thank you for sharing great information and insights. And thank you to everyone who joined us for today's session. Coming up in the next few weeks, we've got some wonderful topics for you. On July the 1st, we have our World Tour of Inclusive Publishing Initiatives. Our stellar panel includes Hugo Setzer, Mexican publisher and president of the International Publishers Association, Deborah Nelson, who is chief executive of eBound Canada, Brad Turner, who leads the world's largest collection of accessible ebooks at Bookshare, and Kersey Elan, representing the Nordic Inclusive Publishing Initiative. We'll learn about initiatives that are underway in many regions of the world to bring accessible publishing to reality, and we'll contrast these different approaches and I anticipate a very interesting panel discussion. On July the 8th, pack your bags. We're going on a trip as we follow the journey from publisher to student and experience the accessible EPUB ecosystem in action. And on July the 15th, we'll talk about scaling inclusion in the transition to remote teaching. The rapid switch to online learning has in many cases amplified the barriers faced by some learners with disabilities. In this webinar, our friends from Blackboard Ally will share analysis from users from thousands of education institutions around the world and will discuss pragmatic solutions for effective and efficient inclusion. Find out more information at daisy.org forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up to the webinar announcement mailing list to learn about new topics as we add them. And if you would like to suggest a subject or if you're considering presenting a webinar, then please email us at webinars at daisy.org. I hope you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.